Let's raise our voices. There 
Hey, welcome back, Cornerstone. Some are excited. Hey, we have a great weekend for you guys to be here. We're kicking off our new series over the next several weeks called Experiencing God. We've talked about this for the past few months. We're expecting God to do so much in our church family over the course of this series. Something that's really incredible about this is we're doing this together. This is a groups-based, community-based series. We want to be able to experience God, hear from God in our lives, but we want to do this together. We can learn so much from each other. So I want to encourage you to text EXP to 21999. When you do that, there's a place there for you to sign up to lead a group. Maybe you've done that before. Maybe God has you in a place to help others experience God. There's a place for you to say, I want to do that. There's also another place for all of us. Say, I want to be in a group. When you do that, somebody this week will reach out to you, get you connected in community somewhere around where you live, and we'll experience God together. There's also a workbook that goes along with this. There's something to help you take notes as God speaks to you through the series, some questions for you to really think through about how God's working in your life. And when you go outside on the patio, there's a place for you to purchase one of those just outside here today. So we get started this week with that series, and we're hopeful for what God's going to do. So welcome back, Cornerstone. Man, I want to also make sure we give a special welcome for our guests. We've got so many guests every week in here. I want you to know you are so welcome. We're pumped that you're here. We'd love to connect with you. Probably the easiest way to do this is if you text NEW to 21999. You're going to find out just today we text all kinds of things to 21999. Take out your phone, text NEW. We'll connect with you that way. Or when you go out to the lobby, just to the left is a NEW HERE START HERE booth, and somebody there would love to speak with you, and they've got a free gift for you just for being our guest. So welcome. Hey, man, at Cornerstone, we really value community here. We have so many spaces throughout our church for all of you, no matter where you're at in life, no matter what your life stage is, no matter what struggle that you may be experiencing today, there's so many places for you to get connected in community with others to walk through that with. One thing I want to raise is our care groups. So many things that we experience in our life where just others are helpful, like maybe you've experienced loss in your life. We've got a group called Grief Share. Maybe you're walking with someone or experienced cancer in your life. I lost my mom to cancer. There's a group specifically for you. There are a ton, of, maybe it's addiction. There's a ton of different places for you to plug into where there's others that can walk through those seasons of life with you. If you text CARE to 21999, you're going to find out all the different ways that we have community there for you. Something else is our marriage ministry. Man, if you've been with us for the past several months, you know, God's laid in our heart to really invest in the families and the marriages here of our church. Now, whether you're engaged and not married yet, we've got something there for you. It's called Merge to help you understand what it's like to be married. Some of those surprises that you may not know about so far, but that's there for you. Maybe you've been married for, you know, years and you just want to reconnect or you're facing challenges that you want to work through. Re-engage is there for you. Maybe... Maybe you've been in a broken marriage before and need healing. We've got spaces for you there as well. Just text marriage to 21999 and find out all the places God has for you here at Cornerstone in that. And then maybe you just want to grow in understanding who God is and his word. We've got men's studies, women's studies all launching this week. Different days, different weeks, different studies. So many places for you to get connected and find friendships for life and grow in community. You can text CS Men to 21999. See all of our men's studies, CS Women to 21999. There it goes again, all of our women's studies and find out again everywhere that God has places for you to belong here at Cornerstone. I wanna come back to our Cornerstone family for just a minute and just say thanks so much for you guys. Thanks so much for your generosity. It's your tithes and offerings that move forward the mission and ministry here in our church. Everything that we do here is because God saves and because you give. So just want to say thanks for that. And if you haven't taken that step, if you haven't given yet, you can do that today. It's super easy. Guess what? Text GIVE to 21999. And just be a part of everything God wants to do here in our family of faith. So for more of what's going on here at Cornerstone, check this out.
After 16 years of marriage, I realized that we didn't really know each other. We've done a complete 180. We're actually growing together. Marriage is better here. At Cornerstone, we are dedicated to the mission of strengthening marriages. Whether you're engaged or looking to strengthen your marriage, we're committed to helping engaged and married couples grow. For engaged couples, we have Merge, where you can learn what marriage really means in a safe and informative environment. In our first year of marriage, it just really helped a lot. We also have Re-Engage, where married couples can reconnect, reignite, and even resurrect their marriage. Every marriage faces its challenges. Through these courses, married couples can learn strategies to face challenges growing stronger together and with God. I suffered from just really bad anxiety, so bad that one day I just fainted. Nobody knew, nobody knew what was wrong, but inside I knew, I knew what the problem was. A friend of mine posted a verse that cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And it was like my eyes opened to see that. He's been there waiting for me the whole time with open arms. He was ready for me whenever I was ready for him. And I'm just thankful that everything has changed. Through Jesus, I have a renewed mind, a restored heart, and a new identity. In the words of Paul, the old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Hey, Cornerstone. How you doing? So, two weeks ago, I was supposed to go in for knee replacement on my left knee. Apparently, I've worn it out. So, the day before I'm going in for knee replacement, uh, our neighbors are walking their dogs down the street. Lisa and I go over to talk to our neighbors. We pet the dogs. Uh, we petted the first dog, and uh, it was all great. And then the owner walked the second dog over for us to pet it. And I put my arm down straight because I don't ever want to be reaching at a dog. You know, and so I put it down straight so he could smell it. And dog walked right up to my arm and went <laughs> and took a bite. I showed up for surgery the next morning, and I've got ooze coming out. And the surgeon says, no, we're not going to uh, do the operation. You've got to get the infection all cleared up. I say all of that to say that I am absolutely pumped full of medicine uh, today, trying to get rid of the infection and get me ready for surgery again. If I say something really weird or, okay, blank, don't write me, it was the medicine, okay? I'm already telling you, it's the medicine, okay? Hey, we're uh, first week uh, in our series called Experiencing God. We did this series a little over seven years ago. We brought it back because it is an absolutely remarkable study. It's a life-changing study. And uh, it, it takes us through this idea of saying, hey, I'm going to start becoming more aware of what God is doing all around me. I'm, I'm going to join God in the things that he's doing. And because I'm now in his plan, because I'm working with him and maybe not against him or ignoring him, all of a sudden I start experiencing God on a whole different level in my life. And my, my Christian growth is absolutely accelerated during that period of time. So guys, I'm just encouraging you. This is a life-changing study. You're going to want to lean in. And there's two ways that I'm going to ask you to really, really lean in. Uh, the first is, this study has a workbook with it. And I know some of you are going, man, I, I thought I was done with school. It's an easy, easy, easy workbook. Every single day you go in, there's like a page you read. It's like a little teeny devotional. And then it asks you uh, three, four, five really reflective questions. So in other words, we would say something like, hey, if, if God has asked us to be kind to one another, who's somebody in your life you could be kind to today. So it's, right, it's, it's just self-reflective, gets you thinking uh, differently. Uh, I'm gonna encourage everybody, go out on the patio, we got a booth that's out there, buy a book so that you can follow along. All the messages on Sunday are gonna tie in. This is gonna take you further, deeper into the study. And here's the second piece, which is probably the most important. I'm gonna ask you to please, 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 please be in a group for this study. Uh, here, here's what I have found. There have been times when I was doing this, I would do a whole week, and I get done with the week, and I go, oh, 
man, that was dry. I didn't, I didn't get anything out of that week. I got to the group study, and suddenly someone would say, this was the best chapter ever. And I'm like, what? And then they'd start telling me what God had done in their hearts and in their lives. And all of a sudden, it would start kindling something in me. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I haven't, and I, right? And it just, it took me to a different level. And I would have never experienced that if I hadn't done this study in community with others. So I know what some of you are fearful of. You go, look, I don't uh, have any friends. I can't do this as a study. Here's the answer. Just go out on the patio as you're buying the book. Say, look, I'm willing for the seven weeks, I'm willing to be in a group. I want to be in a group. I want to experience this as much as I can. They'll find you a group. And then you'll be able to do it. You do it the seven, and then you're done, right? But please, please, please don't do this solo. You will not get as much out of it. At the very, 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 very least, find one person to do it with you. Have your wife or your husband do it with you. Have a friend do it, but don't do this alone. I'm telling you, the interaction of it takes it to a completely, you'll, have, you'll get this much out of it if you do it by yourself. You'll get this much if you do this in community. You have somebody else pushing in and having the conversation. So please, go out on the patio today, sign up, okay? Get into a group, buy a book. All right, today's conversation, principle number one is simply this. That God is always, underline always, God is always at work. Some of you would say, hey, uh, you're going to have a hard time proving that by me. Because I've got this thing, I've got this problem in my life, I've got, I got this, this like roadblock, this, you know, I've, I've been praying to God about my health, or I've been praying to God that I'd get married one day, or I, I've been praying to God about my promotion, and I'm just telling you, I, I've been praying like crazy. I told God exactly what he needed to do, and he hasn't answered my prayer. So, Lynn, when you say, hey, God is always at work, you can't prove it by what's going on in my life. If you're feeling that way, you need to know that there's a character in the Bible who would have had the same complaint as you. Uh, He's a guy by the name of Moses. And in his lifetime, uh, Israel has been in captivity in Egypt for nearly 400 years. He would say, I've been praying every day of my life that you would release us, that you would free us from this captivity. We're we're literally slaves. And it's not only my prayer, every generation for 400 years has been praying the same thing. And God, you've been unmoving, you've been silent. Can't prove to me that God is working. And in frustration, Moses says, okay, I guess if if God's not going to do something, then I'm going to do something. I'll I'll take this matter into my own hands, and I may not be able to fix the whole problem, but maybe I can move this issue forward a little bit. And so out of frustration with God and not being able to see God doing what God needed to do, Moses takes matters in his own hands. So grab your Bibles and go with me to Exodus chapter 2. If you're not familiar, if you go to the front of your Bible. You're going to find this because Exodus is the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus. Uh, Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. This is the moment in frustration that Moses just says, God, if if you're not going to respond, if if you're not going to, because God is telling you, I don't see you doing anything about this issue, about this problem. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And here it is. It's Exodus chapter 2. Verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and he watched them in their hard labor. So the Egyptians are oppressing them and being unfair. Uh, He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and that way and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one that was in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? We're on the same side. We got a bigger problem than this. The man said, who made you ruler over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and he thought, 
what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. And I know most of us say, well, wait, wait, wait. I mean, I'm not going to murder somebody. No, no, but isn't it true that we've all had this same struggle? We've all been tempted the same thing. Hey, I've been praying about this. I've been asking God, and I'm just telling you, it does not look like God's at work. I don't, I don't see God doing anything in my life about that. And that you and I have been tempted to go, well, then I'll just take matters in my own hands. I'll, I'll make something happen in my own life in my own way. Here's the interesting thing. The reality is, is that God had been working in miraculous ways, and Moses simply couldn't see it. He's so stuck on his idea of what God should do. See, Moses would say, hey, by now, by now, you should have freed us. So God, you're way late, and, and you should have raised up some like superhero to lead us out of Egypt, and I don't see anybody. And Moses had his, his eyes so fixed on his idea of what God should do in a moment like this, he can't see what God is doing, you ready? In his very life. Because here's the rest of the story about Moses. Moses is born during a period of time when uh, Egypt has commanded the people of Israel to commit infanticide. In other words, there's so many Jews being born that they say, look, pretty soon there'll be more Jews than there, are, than there are Egyptians. We better slow down the growth rate. And so it's ordered that every single male that's born has to be put to death. Moses is born during that period. His mother, not willing to kill him, hides him for a period of time. So think about this. Moses should have been able to look out and go, you realize of my, of my age group, there is nobody. There's nobody a little bit older than me and nobody else. I'm the only one God has spared. His mother hides him for a period of time and uh, then realizes I can't keep doing this. It's going to be known. Some mother is going to say, wait a minute, I had to kill my child. How come she didn't have to kill hers? And so she fashions a little reed basket. She puts tar pitch on the inside. She sets Moses in it and then pushes it out into the Nile River, just saying, God, I, could you please do something? The, the basket uh, floats down the Nile River, which is full of crocodiles. No crocodiles eat Moses. But that's just luck, right? That can't possibly be the hand of God in Moses' life. The, the basket ends up floating down and gets stuck in the reeds right next to where the daughter of Pharaoh is bathing. But that's just luck, right? I mean, that's circumstance. That can't possibly be God working in Moses' life. She sends an attendant over because she hears a baby crying. She looks at it and she says, oh, this has got to be Hebrew because he's not circumcised. And she instantly falls in love with Moses. But that's just circumstance, right? That can't possibly be the hand of God in Moses' life. It can't be God doing his work. She adopts Moses, takes him into the palace, and now Moses is raised as the step-grandson to Pharaoh. But that's, that's just happenstance, right? That can't possibly be the work of God. And guys, Moses is so fixed on what he believes God should do and what he's been praying and telling God to, he can't see that God has been working in his life for his entire life. And guys, he's about to mess up the plan because he's going to put his own hands in and do his own thing and kill an Egyptian and have to flee. If he hadn't done that, and I don't know how the story goes because Moses doesn't let us know. But I'm guessing this, either he's going to have someone of influence that he becomes friends with and he's able to explain the plight of the Hebrews and they'll end up released. Or maybe Moses is actually going to be put in a position of authority. It might even be his signature that one day releases the... You and I don't know because Moses screws it up because he's so convinced that God isn't doing anything, he decides to do something. And guys, here's what you need to know. God is at work in your life, maybe even especially in the moments you don't see him, the, the moments he's not answering the prayer the way that you prayed the prayer. And the worst thing you and I could do in that moment would be put our hand in and try to fix it for God. So let's talk for a little while. How is it that you and I can have these seasons of our life, these moments of our life, where we go, I, I, I just don't even see God. I don't... 
I don't, I don't see him doing what I think he needs to do. I don't see him working where he needs to work. And is it possible that he's actually working all around me? But my eyes aren't seeing it. Number one, first way in which we miss God at work. You need to know that it's absolutely normal for God to be doing great things when it looks like he's doing nothing. Let me say this again. It's a big deal. It is absolutely normal for God to be doing unbelievably amazing things in moments that look to us like he's doing nothing. Here's why. If you haven't noticed yet, God doesn't usually typically tell us his plans. And, and, I, and I don't know why. I don't know if that's because if you and I heard what he was going to do, we would like veto it. Or if he told us what we were going to do, we would be terrified. Or we'd just go, hey, God, you know what? I like your plan pretty well, but could we tweak it a little? And instead, here's what God does. God works in our life and says, okay, I'm going to do this. And sometimes it looks good and sometimes it looks bad, but I'm, I'm going to do that. You're not going to know where this is going to go. I'm just going to ask you to live the next moment that I gave you the right way. And when you live that moment well, I'll give you a next. And then I'll give you a next. But you're not going to know where this is going to end up. Hey, guys, the first time Lisa saw me, if God would have told her that it was in his plan for her to marry me, she would have vetoed it. I'm just telling you, I, I, when I got to Bible college, man, I, I was skinny as a rail. Uh, people told me to stick out my tongue so I'd look like a zipper. I mean, I would... I, and the first time Lisa saw she was absolutely unattracted to me. So God didn't tell her. By the grace of God, God waited a little while. I put on 20 pounds, and she was like, hmm. Now, we're not going to talk about that since then. I put on another 30. Okay, but you get it, right? God's got a plan, but he doesn't tell us. that. He just says, hey, here's the next, and live that moment. I'll tell you the next. Which means there's moments when I'm living in a moment that I'm going, God, this is unfair and it's wrong and I don't, I don't see you working. Think about Daniel. Daniel's a young man. He's in Israel and now the armies of Babylon are attacking Israel. And Daniel in that moment would say, I understand God. Israel's turned against you. You're, this is just punishment for all of Israel. But here's the deal. I haven't. I haven't, I've lived holy, I've lived righteously, I, I haven't done what everybody else is doing. Don't you know, in a moment like that, Daniel probably prayed, hey God, when, when Babylon wins, would you just keep me safe? If they take everybody off to captivity, would you let me stay here? And so Babylon comes in, they conquer Israel, and now Daniel is being dragged off to Babylon don't you know in a moment like that that Daniel probably in his heart said, hey, God, why? Why, why aren't you answering my prayer? Why, why aren't you doing what I asked you to do? And what Daniel has no idea is that God is repositioning him. He's going to take him to a country where he is literally going to turn that country upside down for God. But it came, the, ready? the first thing that happened was a moment in which Daniel would have said, I don't see God working. Think about Joseph. Joseph has been sold into slavery unfairly by his brothers. He tries to make the most of the moment. He's simply trying to be the best servant in the house of Potiphar that he can. Suddenly, Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him that he made advances at her. Don't you imagine that Joseph in that moment offered a prayer that he said, hey, God, look, 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 could you just let the truth come out? Could you let her lie be seen and my faithfulness be upheld? And Potiphar doesn't believe it. He gets thrown in jail. You don't think that Joseph sitting in jail wanted to say, hey, God, where are you? I was doing the right thing, and now it feels like I'm in the wrong place. I don't, I don't see you working. I don't see you answering prayer. Some of you heard me tell the story of my life and that I was working as a youth pastor at a church, and they ended up hiring a new pastor who came in, and the new pastor who came in wanted the staff that he'd had at the old church to be at the new church, which meant he had to get rid of all of us. And so he literally began to start a file on every single buddy on staff so that he could bring cause against them to have them released. Uh, he ended up uh, picking the biggest loudmouth on the staff, 
I don't know who that was. And uh, he went to the elder board and said, hey, here's my cause against this guy. I'm going to tell you right now that, that, he had, that everything he said was absolutely frivolous. I promise. And uh, the elder board said, well, okay, uh, if he's that big a problem, uh, fire him. It's interesting because one of the elders on the elder board was actually a sponsor in my youth group. His two sons had grown up in my youth group. He had said to me over and over again, I cannot tell you how happy I am that you're my son's youth pastor. Their lives have been changed. And I went to him afterwards. I said, how did you vote to let the pastor fire me for no real cause? And he said, well, he's the pastor. He gets what he wants. And I said, well, I'm not sure that that's what an elder is supposed to do. And so now I'm packing my boxes. And, and you want to know what my heart was saying? Hey, God, where were you? Th this is so unfair. Well, why, didn't, why didn't you let my righteousness show up? Why, why did you let this man with horrible intent win the day? And I'm just going to tell you, I could not see in that moment God working. I thought he was asleep at the wheel. If you have your Bibles, grab them, go with me now to Jeremiah chapter 29. And if you're not familiar, if you just go to the middle of your Bible, you're going to find this book of Jeremiah. It's a passage that some of us have seen a hundred times. It's Jeremiah chapter 29. It's verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says this. This is God speaking. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And you go, yeah, 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 I've heard it before. Have you ever asked the question, why did God have to put that verse in the Bible? Why did he have to tell us, hey, I know I've got plans for you. And my plans are going to be for your good. They're going to, why did he have to tell us that? Because there were going to be moments in my life where I'm going to say, I don't see God working. I don't see him answering prayer. I see evil winning and, and I'm losing. And I, I, don't, I, I just think God is absent. And God says, no, 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 no. I have a plan. And even though in this moment that plan feels dark, and even though at this moment it feels like I'm being silent, I'm working a plan. And all I'm asking, you ready? All I'm asking, live this moment well. When you live this moment well, I'll give you the next moment. And guys, think about this for a second. You and I should know this, because isn't it true that when you look back over your life and you look at the moments in which God has done his very best work when he's, when he's come up big, when you've grown the most in your Christian walk, didn't it usually come on the other side of struggle? Didn't it usually come on the other side of unfairness? And isn't it true that there was at least a moment in all of that that you wanted to say, God, why aren't you answering my prayers? And now you look back and go, oh. God had a plan. So why do we in this moment all of a sudden lose our faith? Reason number two. The second reason that we miss seeing God and what he's doing is that we're so focused on our plan that we don't see what God is working on and doing. Isn't that exactly Moses, right? Moses was saying, God, by, you're way too late. You should have raised somebody up by now. He's so focused on what he thinks God's not doing because he's telling God what he should do that he can't see that his entire life has been God working a plan in him because he's so focused on what God's not doing. See, this is the single gal who says, God, look, you're screwing this up. I already told you. I want to be married by the time I'm 23. I want us to buy a house by the time we're 25. I, I want us to pop our first kid at 26. And God, I'm 29. You're not working the plan. God, you look silent and absent, and, and how come? I can't see you working. What if? What if, single gal? There's something in your life that you haven't surrendered to God yet. There, there is a way that you treat people that is really unbecoming. And what if God was going to bring an amazing, amazing guy into your life, but he would see that character flaw in you and he would turn and go away? And what if the reason you're not is because of what you haven't allowed God to do in you yet? And if God told you that, hey, if you would just fix this, I could bring this unbelievable, remarkable husband in your life. I'm working a plan. 
And just because God hasn't told you the plan doesn't mean he's not working the plan. See, this is the guy who says, hey, I, I, I should have been promoted by now. And here I am, I'm stuck in this same department, it's been seven years, and I'm more qualified than the last guy they hired, and how come, God, how come, I, by now you should have? And what if God says, no, you, well, you don't understand. I've got something bigger going on. There's two people in that department that you're their best chance of ever figuring out Jesus. This, this is a matter of heaven and hell, and you're the one you're the one that's going to help them find me. And so I'm leaving you in that department because I have greater plans for you. Is it possible that one of the reasons we miss God's plan is because he's not doing ours? So that brings us in the question, well, how, how do I begin to start working with God? How do I start, begin to start seeing what he's doing in my life? Number one, you got to surrender your plan. You got to surrender your plan. So, you, most of you know, I, I was a youth pastor for a whole bunch of years. I got, I got done. I just said, look, I can't be in a cabin with junior high boys another time. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't have that little 13 year old girl come up to me whose boyfriend was pressuring her to have sex with him, and then he ended up breaking up with her, and now she's crying and she's going, My life is ruined, and I just want to scream at her, That's the best thing that could have happened to you. And I said, Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe it's time for me to start working with adults because they'll have better problems. <laughs> so I came up with a plan. Here was my plan. I'm going to put my resume out there. I'm going to find a really good, really solid established church. I'm thinking, you know, maybe five, 600 people, good facility, good location. That was my plan. Guess how many churches gave me a call? One. One in downtown L.A. There were 18 people, and they said, hey, we're the 18 last white people in downtown L.A. Come help us stand up. I said, no, that's not, that's not the plan. But here's what you gotta get in that moment. My plan was to go be a pastor of an established church. I had no desire, no desire to ever go plant a church in Chandler, Arizona. If I had worked my plan, you realize Cornerstone wouldn't exist today. And guys, I'm just telling you, if you work your plan, you will miss the wonder of God. And the first thing you've gotta be willing to do is just say, God, I'm gonna surrender my plan. I, your plan is better than my plan. I'm surrendering the plan. Matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me real quick again. And again, another passage that many of you will be familiar with. We just have a hard time living it. It's Romans chapter 12. It's verse 1. This is Paul talking to you and me. Romans 12, 1. Here's what he says. It says, therefore, I urge you, I beg you, Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, the goodness he's done for you, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. He's saying, take your whole life. Give it to God and say, God, we're going to put you in charge and not me. Which includes, you ready for this? Your plans. Hey, God, is, I'm giving you my plan. I want to do your plan. You'll be amazed when you surrender your plan to God how quickly you begin to see him working. Second thing, make yourself available. Guys, we live in a time and a culture right now where most of us, our schedules are absolutely maxed out. We are busy, 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 busy. We, we don't have two minutes to rub together. And guys, here's what you need to hear. Being busy is not a virtue. Somehow we think it makes us look productive and like... When they invented the, the washing machine, you know what the inventors of the washing machine said? We're going to be giving housewives across America all sorts of free time. But what did we do, right? What, you know, so what we naturally do as humans, you give us a little bit of free time, we find something to fill it. We've got kids going to soccer practice and gym to go to. All right, we fill it. What if being busy isn't a virtue? Because it's possible to be so busy I can't be a good parent. It's possible to be so busy I can't be a good spouse. It's possible to be so busy I'm not a good follower of God because I'm unavailable when he taps me on the shoulder. 
I want you to consider, how many of you could honestly say, hey, I've got enough margin in my life that if God tapped me on the shoulder and he said, hey, I want you to get involved in this, you'd go, oh, okay, I, I left margin just for that. Did you know the average person right now in America goes to church one every four Sundays? You know why we go one in every four Sundays and not every Sunday? Because we're busy. And we go, hey, I got laundry to do and there's a great football game on and I need to rest because last week was, right? One in four. What if, think about this, what if the Sunday you didn't come was the sermon you needed? And you go, hey, God, you're not working in my life. Well, you weren't there when I had the conversation. You were home doing laundry. Is it possible that you and I are too busy to see God working? And what would happen if you and I just said, hey, look, I'm gonna, maybe I'm not going to the gym this week, or maybe, what, I don't, maybe my kid doesn't have to be involved in 33 sports. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it to church every week so that I could see God working in my life. Every once in a while, you hear us have calls and say, hey, we need some people to help in the youth group. And what's our, what, no, I'm too busy. But what if there's a little guy in the youth group who's thinking about suicide? And you, because you're too busy, miss the opportunity to be there in that moment when he's most sad and most depressed and be able to say, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. And you would miss that, the wonder of God, because you're too busy to see God work in a high schooler's life? Guys, if you're going to see God work, you've got to start being available to God. You've got to say, God, here I am. If you tap me, I'm going to respond. I'm going to make myself available to you. We had a thing just recently uh, called Reengage. Uh, we ended up, we had way more people sign up for Reengage. It, it's a marriage uh, thing that we do. And uh, it's part of our initiative to say, hey, we're going to just have great families here at Cornerstone. And uh, more people signed up than we, than we thought. And so all of a sudden, we were having to go to leaders and tap leaders on the shoulder and say, hey, uh, would you consider uh, taking a Monday for the next 14 weeks and leading a Reengage group? And guess what? Every one of those leaders' first words out of their mouth was, I would, but I'm busy. And here's the conversation we had to have. I know you're busy. I'm asking you to consider setting something aside and making yourself available for this. Because we believe God is going to do something. We, th we think this is going to be a, a remarkable moment in our church. Would you... Make yourself available by taking something out of your schedule and making yourself available to lead one of these groups. Can I tell you that as I've met with group leaders who made that decision, I'm going to take something out of my life to be, every one of them ran some race. None of them, none of them has said to me, man, I'll tell you what, worst decision ever. Man, those 14 weeks were torture. You know what every one of them says? I watched God move. I watched lives be transformed. And the really, really cool thing was God used me at that table to be part of it. And guys, I'm just telling you, if you want to see God working, you need to be available when God taps you on the shoulder. You need to be available to say, hey, I'm going to carve out time. I'm going to put something that's good aside to do something that's greater with God. Final thing. If you want to see God working, you've got to stop asking why. Start asking what. Let me say this again. It's a big deal. Stop asking why. Start asking what. Because here's the deal. When you and I ask why, it turns us into victims. See, when we go, hey, God, why? Why are you letting that person be so mean? God, why didn't I get the promotion? God, why am I not? God, God right? Why turns me into the victim? And, and, and why takes my mind to a place that says, God's not doing what God ought to be doing, and now I get angry and resentful toward God. A better question is what? Hey, God, what are you doing? What are you teaching me through this injustice? What, what are you doing in this moment of real struggle? What, what, what is your plan right now? Remember, I told you about getting fired at that church. And I'm going to tell you, I started with why. Man, I sat there packing my boxes, and I'm, I'm going through, God, why would you let this happen? 
Man, my youth group is amazing. People who should have stood up for me didn't stand up for me. Why did you let this evil man be the pastor of the church? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, right? Wise. And my wise had me in the dump. Somewhere I realized I needed to be what? Hey, God, you've clearly closed the door here. What are you doing? And he didn't give me an immediate answer, but it lifted my eyes to start saying, God's got to be doing something in the midst of this injustice. What are you doing, God? He took me to a little church, had a horrible little youth group in a tiny little town. I said, God, what are you doing? Can I tell you that it was there? That God took everything that had been taken from me and restored it doublefold. That I got to lead a youth group that turned that little town upside down for Jesus. It was the first time in my life I saw God not just do a good thing in me, but to do an amazing, remarkable thing through me. And I would have never gotten there if I hadn't asked what, because what allowed me to say, you know what? I'm gonna, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to do it with all my might and all my heart, and I'm not going to resent God for it. I'm going to live in it. Stop asking why. Started saying, hey, God, what are you doing in my marriage? What are you doing in my workplace? What are you doing in the life of my children? Because it looks unfair, and it looks like I haven't had an answer prayer. But I know you've got a plan. So would you at least let me see the next step? Not why, what? Here's what I'm going to ask us all to do. For seven days till we get back together again. I'm going to li- ready. I'm going to ask you every morning to say, God, would you let me see you at work today? Would you let me see you do something in my life today? And then, you ready? I surrender my plan. We're not working my plan this week. We're working your plan this week. I surrender my plan. Second thing, God, I'm available. If you, if you tap me on the shoulder and say, go over there and do that or talk to that person or be part of that ministry, I'm telling you, I will carve time out to be available to you because I want to see you work. And then finally, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I don't understand it. I don't get it. But would you be kind enough to just tell me the next step in my life that you require from me? Let's pray. Hey, dear Lord Jesus, and we, we have lived so much of our lives thinking that you weren't listening, thinking that you weren't being attentive. We've been so frustrated that you weren't hearing us and doing our plan, and we, we thought that you were just absent, and yet you've been working all around us. It was our heart posture that kept us from seeing you and experiencing you in our lives. And so God, For this next week, we're going to surrender our plans. We're going to make ourselves available. And we're going to say, not why, but God, what are you doing? And when you tell us what the next step is, we'll do the next step. Because we want to see you working in our lives. This we pray in your precious name. Amen. Hey, today... uh, where two people enjoyed that, right? <laughs> Thank you for the golf clap. All right, uh, no, I'm, te- I'm teasing, I'm teasing. We're going to do communion today. I cannot think of a more fitting way for us to jump into experiencing God than to say, hey, God, I want my life ready for this. Because here's one of the things we do in communion. We think about how incredible it is that Jesus died for our sins. So we take a moment of reflection and make sure we've confessed all of our sins, that our lives are ready and available for God. So I'm going to give you that moment right now. If you didn't get a communion thing on the way in, you can raise your hand. They're bringing them down. But I want you to just take like the next 30 seconds to say, God, is there anything in my life that's standing between you and me? I want that right. I I want to be standing with clean hands in a moment like this. So just take that next 30 seconds. You and God have a conversation. Is 
Scripture says that uh, in the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is representing my body. It's, it's telling you what's about to happen tomorrow, that, that I'm going to be hung on a cross and broken for you. Take and eat. In that same night, he took the cup. He said, this cup is to remind you of the blood that I'm going to shed, the blood that's going to pay for your sins. And it's interesting that we receive communion because it becomes this constant reminder, I didn't earn salvation. I received Jesus in my life. I received his gift for me. And in that night, Jesus took the cup and said, drink ye all of it. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you did on the cross for us. God, we sit in this moment not wanting anything between you and us, and so we confess our moments of hesitation, our moments of saying no, our moments when we stepped over the line. We want to be in right stead with you, and especially as we begin this whole series about experiencing you, we want to start in good relationship with you. And God, I'm just going to ask that our church would come alive to this, that we'd get our books, we'd get into community, into studies, and that, God, you would do amazing things in and through us. God, be with us this next week. Help us to see you working all around us. In this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, here's what we're going to do. You're going to head out, you're going to buy a book, you're going to join a group. If you need prayer, you're going to come to the front and find someone to pray with.